so really quickly I can cover what this um, agenda is going to be. So I have a really quick slide about a welcome to the session. And then specifically, this is just about ArborTech. So I want to talk about some authoring tips with the product. And then I'll also get into a little bit of ad, um, admin in case there's admins on here or those of you that kind of play a dual role where you're not only using the product as an end user author, but you're also responsible for the administration of it. And then I also want to get into some upcoming events that we have, uh, not only the additional webinars, but we have some other really cool things that we're working on um, for this new year. So welcome. Uh, everybody's audio is muted, but you can definitely ask questions in the um, question QA manager, and then we will take those towards the end. You can send them to all of the panelists. Um, that might be most helpful so that folks can um, jump on and, and help you out if you're having any technical issues. So again, audio is muted, but please ask questions. The session is being recorded, and it's the first in a series of back to school sessions, and I'll talk about what the rest of those are at the very end here. Year. I also wanted to point out a lot of you were invited by our mailing list and I've been inviting you to join our mailing list. So what happens is um, any additional marketing events or webinars or anything we're working on, we want to make sure that um, you are seeing <clears throat> Sorry, that you are seeing all of that information come from us. So it's going to be this little screenshot you'll see here on the right shows that it's a little email sign-up list. Um, and then, you know, you can always unsubscribe, but we're, we're asking, we're trying to make sure we're getting in touch with all of our ArborTech community, so we do ask that you join that mailing list. And a little bit about me, for those of you that don't know, so my name is Pushpinder Tour. Um, I am the general manager of the Arbortex business unit. So Arbortex is its own business unit within PTC, so that means that we do have um, our uh, direct sales team, we've got marketing, we've got tech support, R&D, all of that kind of rolls under a larger Arbortex business unit. And um, I've been in this industry, those of you that know me, I've been in this industry for 20 years. I've always dealt with ArborText. I've been an end user of ArborText. I've been a technical trainer. I've done consulting. Um, I've done product management, which was my most recent role, and now I'm general manager over the entire product line. I am based out of Ann Arbor, Michigan, where it is a lovely, I think, negative uh, 12 or negative 13 degrees today with a wind chill of negative 40 or something, something crazy. So um, this is actually where Ann Arbor, uh, Ann Arbor is actually where ArborTex was first developed. And you'll hear a little bit about how we're going to connect the dots with a, a event that we're working on towards the end of the year. All right, so in terms of ArborTech tips, the first thing I wanted to talk about really quickly was some housekeeping items. This is really important. Um, I always like to point these out even when I do one-on-one -on -one customer calls, is that you should be going out to our um, release schedule and taking a look at the maintenance releases coming up, releases that we've retired, the last um, maintenance that we might have in a particular stream. So I wanted to call out to everybody that if you are using um, seven, Sorry, our latest releases that just came out in December were 7.1 M40, and for APP, it was 11.2 M40. So I think APP was released in the first week of December. ArborText was released in the last week of December. But those are our latest and greatest maintenance releases that we ask you to um, you know, make sure that you're on to get the, the um the um, best support that you can. Our recently retired versions that I want to point out is we just retired 7.0 and APP 11.1. The last maintenance release went out earlier in uh, last year, and then December 31st was the official date where we've um, retired it. Retiring it simply means that we're unable to do additional bug fixes or code fixes. You can you know, still use it, you can still call tech support, you can still get help on any problem that you have. Uh, it just means we won't be distributing any more maintenance releases. And then in this December 2018 release, I did want to mention there were a couple of new features that I thought I would point out. Um, for those of you that work with um, structures and with our service information manager integration, with an editor, you do get access to publication structures now. Um, you can view them from the um, browser window directly within, our, within editor. There's also improvements that were made to the Help Center. Basically, there were some help topics that were still in a PDF 
and you basically had to scroll through the PDF to find the information. We were able to fix that, and we now have all of these topics that are more easily searchable. And we also made some improvements to completeness checking if you are using key refs and data. So um, there is, you know, there's a lot more about this in the release notes, and uh, but I wanted to point these out just as really quick bullet points here. And then on the right-hand side, I just have a screenshot showing the calendar that I was referring to that you should always take a look at. Also, something really important, I think, is the PTC community. This is a huge community. There are some of you that have been with me in these 20 years, if not more than these 20 years, and you have a lot of knowledge and a lot of value to add. So our PTC community is actually um, one of the bigger communities on the user site that has a lot of um, action and a lot of responses and views. This community also is where I put anything that comes out that has to relate to the product. So, um, you know, new releases, uh, I'll point you to release notes. I also am putting a lot of, um, there's marketing events on here. So one of the things we're doing is we're coming to San Diego to do a one-day road show. Some of our partners are also putting things out here. So you'll notice there's a A&D um, webinar that one of our partners, GPSL, is putting on. So all of that information is located here. So if you do not have an account, I would highly suggest you create one and start getting active, um, whether it's giving us feedback or asking questions, whether they're implementation questions, product usage questions. All right, so let's get into some of the tips and tricks. So I did a tips and tricks webinar about a year ago. So I tried not to repeat any of the content that was in there. So I tried to come up with more fresh ideas. And one of the things that I didn't cover in that last webinar that I actually think is really useful to people is this bookmarks and quick marks feature. Literally what you're doing is you're just marking a location in your document. And that's helpful if you're maybe um, you need to come back to something because you need to check it, so you're just going to make a quick bookmark for yourself. Maybe you're sharing this file with somebody and you want to tell them that there's a particular section of the document that you want them to give you feedback on. Um, the difference between the two is bookmark is you get to name them, so you can create locations in your file and, and um, they're saved from session to session. A quick mark is just a one-time shot. You only get to create one quick mark per file, and when you create a new one, it replaces the location of the old one. And this is all done through the um, insert menu, so you should see insert bookmark and quick mark located here. So if I were to come here and actually do that, um, so bookmarks, as I said, are actually named. So you might want to, for example, in this document, maybe this last itemized list, you're not really sure if you phrase that correctly or you want to go look for some synonyms later, but you know what, I don't really have the time now, but let me mark off this location in the document for myself. Um, so we can call it, you know, just test for this purposes. So there's actually a um, processing instruction that gets um, placed in there. So now, no matter where I am in this file, if I'm down here, um, I can actually go to my bookmark um, and say, you know, go go to that location, and it'll place me right back in front of that list item in that paragraph, and I can figure out what to do with it. So this is a really handy thing to have. As I said, the quick marks is a one-shot deal. You don't have to label them. You don't have to do anything. This is a um, a very dynamic way to um, create that location marker. So that's. That's quick marks and bookmarks for any folks that may not have uh, had the opportunity to use those. So moving on, um, edit as source is something that is also a kind of a power feature of this product. And um, not a lot of people are aware sometimes that you can turn this on and use it. So the power feature is that basically you're opening a, uh, a section of the file or a particular selection as looking at the source or the raw XML completely. And the nice thing is you can type directly into the source window. So if you are that power user and you know how to create your start title and end title, or you know how to put in you know, the raw XML of how to put in um, attributes, whatever it is, you can do that directly of this window. And there are some people, a lot of people I know, that don't mind doing that. 
The other nice thing about this is when you have the selection window and you're looking at the XML source, when you go to save the selection, it'll actually warn you and tell you if what you did was accurate or not. So it is going through um, and making sure you're not breaking any of your um, DTD rules so the validation is turned on. You're also going to notice in the screenshot um, that there's markup for um, symbols. So some people, instead of going to search for a symbol, they know exactly what the, the symbol is called and, you know, that you're going to start with the ampersand name of the symbol and close it with the semicolon. So if I come over here and show you really quickly, if I take this entire chapter. You do have to have full menus turned on, by the way. I should probably point that out. So a lot of things that I talk about in your preferences, you want to make sure that in your preferences, this um, under window, your show full menus is activated. If it's not, some of these options are not going to show up. So be, be aware of that. But if I take this and I'm just going to go and say I'm going to create, excuse me, edit the selection as XML source. My source window is up here, and I can go in, and again, if you know exactly what you want to do, or sometimes people just want to um, fix some quick text, and it's just, uh, it's really a preference, but I could technically go in here, put a new, a new paragraph, I can get the tags right. and then say update selection. So there's my paragraph, right? It says hello. Um, and then if I go in here, and as I said, it's making sure that what you're doing is correct and you're not breaking anything. If I were to suddenly go in here and maybe I had no idea, I just thought I had to put the start of the paragraph, and I go in here to update the selection. Whoops, my parser messages are off the screen. Um, it's going to tell me <clears throat> on line 38 of that file, I don't know, there's some end tag I encountered. I expected it to be an end tag for a para, so um, I'm going to close this element, but you're going to now wind, wind up getting errors. And I'm going to talk about how to fix something like this later, too, okay? And that's my next slide, checking completeness. This is something that every single end user should be aware of, and it's actually something as a best practice that we recommend you build into your process um, in creating content before it goes into production, before it goes into publishing. Checking completeness, one of the things it does is it's going to make sure that you're conforming to the document type or your DTD. So what that means is, did you put in a wrong attribute? Um, did you miss putting in an attribute? Did you miss putting in a um, child element that should have been required? Um, a lot of times what we find with our customers that use this is when you get content from a third party and you try to open it and add it, like let's say you have somebody else that's also working on the content and you've inherited the content and you try to open it up and it just says you've got problems, you know, it says the validation's turned off. The check completeness is what's going to help you figure out line by line what's wrong and what's missing. It comes up with errors and it comes up with warnings. Errors are considered um, fatal, meaning you're probably going to break something downstream and you're not conforming to the requirements of the document. Warnings are, I'm just letting you know, you might want to fix this, maybe it'll break something downstream, but you should be aware that um, this is a problem. The nice thing about this completeness checking is that you can also save this log. You can actually go and print, go to the file menu, publish this, and then that way you can share it, whether it's, I don't know, maybe there's a tech support person uh, internally that helps you, maybe it's another um, uh, author of the content, so you can actually send this and then be able to um, work through what the markup errors are if you need help. But as best practice, again, I can't stay this enough, we always recommend that you are checking this complete, doing this completeness check. We've had some customers that actually will build in, um, they'll write a script that goes in and before you um, publish or before you check in the document to a CMS, it runs the completeness check because they'd rather catch it right there than catch it downstream where it can cause bigger problems. So this is something really handy um, to keep track of. Um, another thing, and this is something I actually mentioned in a previous webinar and I got 
a lot of feedback on it that people um, were not aware. And um, so I wanted to bring it up again. And it has to do with printing. Um, you can actually print your exact editor window view with the tags on, with the tags off, however you want to do it. The really nice thing about this is you don't, you know, you don't have to be connected to PE. There's no license required to do this. It's basically what we call an unformatted view. And um, with this unformatted view, you can, you know, some people, you still want to have something in front of you that you're fixing. And you'll notice that I've got red squiggly lines on here because that was exactly what was in the edit view when I did this print. So um, for some folks, whether maybe you're working offline, sometimes you are very interested in the markup and fixing pieces of the markup, and you can't see that when it's a nice published PDF, right? You need to look at the raw um, tags in order to see what you might want to fix. So, um, so this is something to be aware of. Um, of being able to do, and it's simply just under the file menu. There's a print editor view option, and then you could print it to a file, you can print it to PDF, you can print it to your printer, um, whatever your, your needs might be, so. Okay. All right, so then I had a couple of small tricks that I wanted to um, let people know about. One, and some of these are power things. Uh, this first one is more of a power user, but I, I really like this. And that's the ability to actually look up a help topic directly from your command line. You do have to know what the number of that help topic is, um, but that's fairly easy to get from the URL. And that way, if you always need that top, or you know, somebody asks you for that help topic, you could just tell them, go look at 700, go look at 786. It just makes things sometimes easier to access. Another thing that's really interesting to do for our customers is a split and a join. So there are times where you will just have an entire paragraph that's way too large, it's too much content, and you want to split it. Or vice versa, you may have two paragraphs that are one sentence each, and you're wondering, why are these two, you know, two paragraphs? It should just be one big paragraph. So you can go in and um, actually join those elements together so they become one, or vice versa, split them so that they become two. And um, honestly, I have this comment here that IDs are not duplicated. Um, and I'm going to verify this before the slide deck goes out, but, um, and as well as in the FAQs that come with this. But um, in some instances, the, the IDs, it, it depends on if it's your data doc type, if it's doc book, et cetera. Um, but it, it may wind up getting duplicated, in which case you would just have to change it. But the fact is that you're not cutting and copying and pasting and creating new elements to do this. And then I also gave you the help topic just to make a note from my earlier point that this help topic is 6572. Um, another quick thing that I wanted to to share with you is a find replace element. So we all know about find and replace. I want to find a specific piece of text. I want to replace it with something else. Um, but for a power user, sometimes you wind up in situations where you need to find a specific element, but also with a very specific attribute on it. So I'm looking for a paragraph, but only if its language attribute is set to English. And maybe you need to do that because you're, t you're checking um, how well the uh, paragraph is written for English versus French versus Spanish, whatever the case might be. But what you're specifically trying to do is narrow down your search so that you're looking for, um, and that's kind of what the screenshot shows, I'm looking for a paragraph whose language is English, only take me to that location. Um, so you're getting a step deeper than just talking about the contextual content that you have um, in, your, um, in your document. Okay. So let me talk a little bit about admin tips. I think I'm doing okay on time. So the light UI, this is also one that I find a lot of newer customers are not aware of um, or haven't fully taken advantage of. What we consider the light UI is literally a simplified view of the editor window without 
requiring you to do any scripting without having you create any, um, you know, ACL files, any of that. It's literally taking the view of the editor, minimizing um, the number of menu items that the user is going to see, minimizing the number of toolbars they have access to. So I have a screenshot showing on the very top is the full Arbor Text Editor view, and on the bottom is um, the simplified view. So it's actually done through, you, one of the ways you can do it is through an ACL command. So if I come down here and, and I say, um, let me make sure I get the command right. Yep. I'm going to say set light UI. And by the way, as I said earlier, command line is only if you are um, in full menus and you want to make sure that that's checked on in your preferences. So anyway, you'll notice that the um, toolbars uh, decrease. What you're also going to notice is even under the view menu, there's very little that I can change for view. There's also very little I can do under edit. You just saw me go under edit where I was going to um, edit the XML source in the previous demo. A lot of the find replace, you'll notice, gets simplified for the user. Um, I think under tools is yep in tools as well. There's a lot that we that we remove, so that's all you're doing here. And then to turn it back on, I'm just going to say off. And if I come back and show you the same menus, you notice it's much larger. Um, under tools, there's administrative tools. Per, you know, there's um, the view gets turned off. So I thought that that was useful to point out to people because um, especially newer users aren't aware that that's there, especially for administrators, if they're trying to make this uh, uh, an easier environment that doesn't go into a lot of the raw XML or power things that editor is known for. Creating a macro. So this is the ability to basically um, take a set of steps or keystrokes and automate that specific task. So we've had customers use these for um, key combinations more than anything. I've also seen it for some menu items, but key combinations. So under the Tools menu, you're going to see an option called Macro, and then you're going to record a new macro. And on this screenshot here, I've got a macro called Language Attribute, and I created one called Test. So this is all stuff I was doing um, yesterday. So in this language attribute, for example, the macro, um, it can be associated on very different levels, by the way. So um, I'm going to put in a little uh, shout out for help. So I would suggest you go look at the help topic for creating macros. But you can create them on the document level. You can create them on the doc type level. Um, it's however you want to distribute them or have them available um, to your users. But basically, if you go in and Let's say the macro is me changing a paragraph so that its attribute is set to English. Let's continue with that flow here. So I'm going to go up to my Tools menu, and I'm going to say I'm going to record a new macro. I've got to give it a test, so I'll call it Webinar. And you can see here where it's storing it, so you can, of course, modify that. You probably want to change the description so it's a little more descriptive as to what exactly the macro is going to help the end user with. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. And there's a little macro um, window that pops up it's on my other screen. It looks like this right there. And um, you'll also notice that my icon turns into what looks like a little tape recorder. So if I click here, and I'm going to go ahead and start the macro, and I'm going to say what I'm doing is I'm changing the language attribute, and I'm changing it to be English. And then I'm going to go ahead and um, stop the recording. So if we want to test that out, we'll come to, oh, let's come to this paragraph. And I'm going to run the macro. Oops. So I'm going to go to the list of macros I had. So here's the ones I created yesterday. Here's the one I created today. So you notice the paragraph has nothing on it. It's just a paragraph, and then it starts an index term. If I run the macro, it immediately went through, and it said, OK, what you wanted to do was in language English. So you can see how this can be huge for um, a very a, a, a set of steps that you're continually doing or you're constantly having to do. And rather than do it through 15 or 20 keystrokes, you can do it through two or three keystrokes by just um, being able to go to the Tools menu and 
have the macro. And for anybody on here that's an administrator, you know you can do a lot of scripting now. If you have the macro written, you can go through and create some ACL scripts um, that can do some more automation of that macro. All right. Publishing rules. Um, this is another one I, I highly recommend you go look at the, the help topics that tell you how to create these. And there's some samples um, that are also in our install tree. But basically, publishing rules is a way to create a set of parameters um, during publishing. So if you always do the same thing during publishing, maybe it's a set of profiles that you always associate. Maybe it's the type of um, output that you want, and you want three different outputs created at the same time. Rather than going through three separate published jobs, you create a publish rule that will allow you to create those three outputs in a one click. So this is all under the Tools menu, under Administrative Tools. Um, and I've got a sample of what it looks like when you're creating the publishing rule. And on the right is um, a screenshot showing the publishing rule that actually comes out of the box in the install tree that you can go look at um, to um, compare and to see how you could set up your own rule. So it's just um, a number of parameters. You can have as many different rules as you want, and each rule is going to have a set of parameters and then as I said, you're going to apply it to a specific doc, doc type. And then those rules will show up for your user when they go to do a published job. Then they would say, I want to use rule one, rule A, B, C, um, however you decide to be um, labeling it. Schematron, this is uh, one that I brought up in a previous webinar, but it I got really good feedback as to folks that weren't familiar with the Schematron or how the product actually um, runs Schematrons. So Schematron is a way to, it's an additional way to make sure that you're following a set of business rules. It's not about following your DTD rules. Your DTD rules are predefined in terms of your elements and your attributes, but business rules are a little bit harder to um, make sure that your users are following. So for example, um, a business rule might be that every single list you create should always have three list items. You should never have a list if you don't have at least uh, a one, two, three, or three bullet points. So you can't really do that with the DTD, but you can do that by creating a schematron um, a schema file and then cr letting those business rules run through excuse me, run through the content. The Schematron file does get placed in the doc type directory. It's something you can, config, can configure in the DCF file. Uh, the DCF file, again, is the doc type configuration file. Um, that's another admin um, part of the application that you would have your administrator work on. And then for the user, they're just going to go to the completeness checks. So remember, we talked about that earlier. And the completeness check is going to have a section now um, saying schema trial warnings. So remember, I told you earlier that errors are kind of fatal errors that will break something for sure downstream because you have broken the rules of the DTD. Warnings are, hey, I really think you should fix this. And that's what the schematron is doing. It's telling you, um, according to the, your business rules, a chapter element should have at least two paragraphs. You shouldn't ever have a chapter where you just have, you know, one sentence or one paragraph. So I the way the um, administrator set it up is you should be putting two in there. So again, this is maybe something that you can do automated because um, you're going to run a completeness check anyway. And that could be a very good business rule, uh, excuse me, business process to run these business rules. It, it's a great best practice. I would definitely recommend if you haven't looked into this that you think about your business rules, the errors that constantly come up downstream for you, and how you can catch them at the beginning rather than dealing with them um, downstream at the end of the process.